Is it possible that you are taking credit for what God has done? Well, many people are and don't even realize it. Something that is vitally important and it pertains to your salvation as well as it pertains to you giving glory to God, and that is how you view your salvation. Sometimes some people may inadvertently take credit for their salvation. In other words, taking credit for what the Lord has done. I want to go to the passage first and then make my point. In Hebrews 12, uh, starting verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witness surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance or weight and sin, which easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Obviously, this race is set before us. It is not us, but it is set before us. But the point is this, so verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Notice what he calls him, the author and perfecter of our faith. I want to look at this word again. Looking on to Jesus, he is the author, the originator, the one that's beginning our faith. He is the one that starts this. Starts what? Our faith. He also ends it. He perfects it. He completes it. That's what this Greek word here is, telos, which means to end, to perfect, to complete. So he is the one that starts it. He's the one that ends it. So in some way, shape, or fashion, and maybe we don't always quite get it, but he originates it and he completes it. Hmm. Maybe that is telling us that we need to make sure that we're giving proper credit to what is due or to whom is due to. I know there are those that are going to say that I give all the credit to the Lord Jesus, but then in the same breath, turn around and say that they are doing something to keep it, to merit it. And they'll say that, no, I'm not boasting, but what does it mean? The Bible tells us that for grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. Now, some folks are going to focus on the through faith as, yes, see, it's my faith that caused me to be saved. However, when we look at this passage, there's a little bit more to it. And again, I know some people get bothered by it, but again, he gave us these words in Greek first. And I think it's imperative that we understand what's being stated. He says, through faith and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. A couple things. The faith that itself, when we look at this, there's a, there's a word that we need to focus on over here in the Greek to figure out what actually is the gift. And how we know it is, is by this Greek word right here, tuta which is this pronoun, this demonstrative that speak this, this. Well, what is this referring to? Well, because this is in the neuter, uh, it's, it, it helps us understand what is the gift. Because the two previous, which is uh, being saved by faith and salvation, they're in two different cases. One is in the masculine, one is in the feminine. But since tuta is in the neuter, then it refers to the proceeding, which means it encompasses both. So both of the things are what has been given to us as a gift, our salvation as well as a faith. May not make perfect sense to us trying to figure this out, but understand he is the one that's working in us with this faith. We'll come to that in just a second, but you don't want to even be able to boast about the faith that you have to say that I'm saved because of my faith, as though your faith is all about you, as though you're the one that originated your faith and you're the one that has perfected your faith. Remember what we just read in Hebrews, he is the beginning, the author of our faith, not just whom we have our faith in. He's more than that. He is the one that perfects it, that starts our faith. He's the one that completes, that ends our faith. That's him. And so going back to this, he says, not as a result of works or ergon, which is ergon, which is you doing it, uh, so that no one may boast. If you're going to turn around and say that it is your faith that is the reason why you're saved, as though your faith is so great, then what are you doing? You may in, you may inadvertently be placing uh, the onus on you and taken away from him so that no one can boast for we are his workmanship. In other words, we we are his. The workmanship, what we have done, what is happening, what we're doing is because and through him created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. There is something that we are to do. And so he's using us to do those things. And all of that, all of us being in him is brought about by our faith. Now, I want to look at something. Look at some passages. He tells us to do something. He tells us to circumcise our heart. Problem is, we just don't. As a matter of fact, if we go to Deuteronomy 10, 16, he tells them early on, before they even go take the land, to circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. The issue is, they don't do it. 
The issue is they never do it. It's always been an issue with man from the garden on man's heart and being obedient have never been where God wants them to. So what is God going to do? He understands that in order for him to be obedient, their heart has to be right. In order for him to trust and believe him, their heart has to be right. They can trust and believe for a day, for a moment in the midst of circumstances when they're in need. But what about when things are casual, when nothing's really happening and, and they have a tendency to forget about him or when things get hot and heavy and they want to find other sources, other means to fix whatever issues are. They will have, we will have a tendency to move away. And so God has to fix or remedy the problem. The problem is our heart. So even though he says that for us or for them to circumcise their heart, they never do. So God's remedy is not just waiting on them to fix their heart, to get their heart right. He says, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. So at some point in time, God has made a promise that at some point in time that he is going to circumcise their heart. Not only just the Jews, but he's going to do the same thing with other people. He's not only doing one certain thing in someone's heart with just the Jews and not the Gentiles. No, he's circumcising all of the people's hearts. And notice what he says. This is why this is important. He says in Ezekiel 36, we bring this up a lot because it is important. This speaks of what God is doing. This is why you cannot even think to take credit. He says, I will put my spirit within you. Notice what he's saying. I, God, will put my spirit within you. And then doing what? What will be the result? Cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. If I, God, put my spirit in you, believer, Jew or Gentile, it will, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And so what you're doing is a result of what he's doing, which is why Paul can make this statement. He says, for I am confident of this very thing that he, that is the Lord, who began that same thing where he says in Hebrews, the author, the beginner, the originator, he who began a good work in you will perfect it. That same word telos is there. He will perfect it until the day of Christ. And so he starts it, he finishes it, he keeps it going. How does he do so? Well, because he puts his spirit in your heart and regenerates you. If you want to come back and take credit for that, I think that borders on the line of just something that's offensive. You are not the one that has caused yourself to have a brand new heart. You are not the one that caused yourself to be born again. As a matter of fact, Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has, look what it says, caused us to be born again. He is the one that's, that's doing this. He causes us to be born again. And ladies and gentlemen, this happens to you. This is not you doing so. This is him doing so. Him causing you to be born again. If it were you that caused yourself to be born again, if it was your decision making, if it was your faith, well, then guess what? Now you've got something to boast about. You've got something to, to, to merit uh, some sort of rewards. You do not. Everything good that's happening in you is because of him. Now, does that mean that there's something that we do? No, I'm not saying that we don't do anything and there's nothing that, that we don't kind of work uh, with the Lord. But in terms of our salvation, no, that's him. Uh, are we responsible for what we're supposed to do? Sure. And are there rewards for that? Sure. Is there disobedience? Are there consequences for being disobedient? Sure. But ultimately, the one that gets the credit is going to be him. Here's an example. Here's something we can think about. Imagine yourself wanting to place your faith in Christ and you have two locations to do so here in America or in Yemen around a Christian culture or around a culture that is anti-Christian. As a matter of fact, you will die likely if you profess Christ outwardly. Which one makes it easier? Well, most of us, many of us listen to this video have been placed in a, in a culture where it's easy to, to make so and so to make the decision and it's not that difficult. But how many people, how many professed Christians will not be professed Christians if they were in Syria or Iran or any other place where you would be visited with hostilities based on your profession of Christ? Well, who did that? The one that determines when you're born and where you're born is God. Does he get credit for that? Yes. Do you? Absolutely not. Some people were brought up in a house where there was just a lot of abuse and neglect and anger and vulgarities and all sorts of profanities, all sorts of things that made it difficult. Some folks were brought up in a house where it was easier. Some people's situation pushed them towards Christ. Some people's situation seemingly pushed them away and there had to be a fight. 
The circumstances around you obviously were not your control. And so whatever it is that has pushed you or caused you or led you to where you are in Christ, who gets credit for that? Well, God does. You don't get an opportunity to take credit. That's the point. God is working things to where he can grow you. How he's doing so? Well, we don't know. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're so high and far above us. But what you don't want to do is find yourself in the place to where you are taking credit. Notice how Jude puts this. He says, now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Not now unto you, because you're able to keep yourself from stumbling. No, it's unto him who is able to keep you from standing. And that's why we can go and look and see, not of works, lest any man can boast. Not of your faith. No one is, no one in the Bible is taking credit even for their own faith. You don't find that in scripture where they can say, I this, I that. We do see some that say, well, listen, I have kept the commandments. I've done what I'm supposed to do. And then we find out. Jesus puts them to the test. Says, we'll sell everything. Let's see about your faith. And they don't have it. And so you don't have the ability. You don't have the right to take credit for what God is doing. Please make sure you are placing Christ in his proper perspective, meaning you are giving all the credit to him. You are not taking credit for your own salvation. It is not what you're doing. It's not what you've done. It's not that you're so smart. You're so faithful. You're so understanding. No. And I want you to consider this. This, I think, puts a, a, a good a good rap on this. He says, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 26, he says, for consider this, for consider your calling, brethren, that you were not, that, that there were not many wise according to the flesh. So you weren't that smart, uh, not many mighty, not many noble, but said something so great about you, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. Now, here it is. Look at verse 29. So that no man may boast before God, but by his doing, notice, by his doing, you are in Christ. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let no or let him who boasts boasts in the Lord. Now, notice what it is. It's by what he has done that we are saved. It's his doing. He says, so by his doing, by his doing, you are in Christ. You are not in Christ because of you, but by his doing. And notice what he says. And so that because of that, you can boast in him. Let him who boasts, boast what? Boast in the Lord. The Lord saved me. The Lord did this. Not that I had faith, strong enough faith. I was smart enough. I was wise enough. I was clever enough. I was knowledgeable enough. I know the scriptures enough so much so that it made enough sense to me. No, there are people who the scriptures make just as much sense as it, to you as it does to them who still are not in Christ. Your salvation rests only in him and only in him alone can you give glory, not to you nor to anyone else, not at the preaching of man or the singing of some choir, but about him. That's why Paul could make the statement that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is that gospel, that preached word that causes some power that emanates from that and his working that leads you to him. It's not you. It's him. So make sure that you're not one of these people either intentionally or unintentionally that are taking credit for your salvation, taking credit for what God has done. Amen.